when I joined in 2002, the, um, well, I guess settlements are different. Even now they're different, but they all had different characteristics. So there were settlements that were not very densely populated. I mean, you could still see spaces. You could still, and, and when I say spaces, it's just the appreciation that children had places to, to, to play. Women had places to do laundry and still feet together. And so are men. You'd have different you know, bases where you'd find, that's where men sit and talk. Um, so you'd, you'd actually find different strata of population doing different things in the settlement. So meaning that there's a lot of public space around around the settlement, so they were not very densely populated. Mokur was also not populated at all, was not that populated. I mean, you'd, you'd still walk a few meters before you, you get to the next house. And then for settlements like Dagoreti, Dagoreti had just started becoming a bit populated. Um, they had their own, their own, they had a very interesting uh, characteristic because they are peri urban. You'd have, actually find homesteads, which you don't find in other settlements. So by homestead I mean that you, you, you'd find some clear demarcations that this is a, a piece of land where one family lives. So there's a main house, there's a house for different children that are probably reached adults who don't, they're still in teenagehood. And then you'd also find spaces where they have their different livestock, so if it's chicken or it's cows or goats. So that's all integrated. So. Whereas it might have looked dense, but then they had the different characteristic and organization around how they used space. So there's a general sense of enjoyment of space going on. But then over the years, when I think about it retrospectively, is that the same settlements I went to five years later, the same spaces that we could see or walk on or just enjoy, uh, being a part of were all taken up by housing and there's an increase in housing stock um, and therefore there's basically some changes in the sense that I think more people had either come into the cities or more more, to, more of the, those that we've found playing as children now had become adults and now they were they had their own homes so there's basically densification going on. By, by 2002 um, acquisition of spaces by urban poor was through squatting and, and invasions, if I was to say that, because there was already a lot of public land that was idle, but there was no housing stock. So people would come, find space and construct. And, and that happened over time. But then over, over the years, part of what has happened in communities is that people had begun understanding the land market. There are those that were brilliant enough to understand that they can make these spaces more commercial. So in a sense, because then they, they've, they've, they've seen the pattern that people are coming and the demand for housing is going on, then you now begin to find that um, there's another layer of political ownership in slum communities where that are in the business of creating housing stock. So that when people are coming, they're not coming to squat. They're coming to look for housing. So you, you're coming, and you come to a settlement and you're looking for a house that between this range of rent, which is very different from what happened by 2002 backwards. Backwards, people were coming looking for a place to stay. So you construct your own house and you live in it. But now things had started changing and the land market had started becoming uh, more understandable within just the sphere of the political economy. And I also began seeing that even upgrading started becoming more complex to do because I used to ask myself, why is it that it was so easy to do Huruma, the model of Huruma, and replicating it was becoming a challenge. But replication was based on the fact that the political organizations of the communities had begun solidifying. And now you had more people understanding that there's, there's, there's a demand that is there. Government is not here, it is us and us. So let's create the housing stock and then we'll have people come and that becomes part of um, part of an informal real estate. I guess an experience that made me understand that was trying to upgrade infrastructure in Madare. And I began understanding that um, upgrading has a lot to do with negotiating yes with the community but also negotiating with another level of political leaders 
who are within the, the communities and these are the people who have innovated the art of providing housing stock. And no form of upgrading can be permitted if you don't go through these people. And I remember we had spent months and months convincing and negotiating to the point that they had agreed and now the other level of agreement was government and government for them was the chief. So I remember a time when we went to, to have a presentation to the chief. But when we went to have a presentation to the area chief, they took a posture that they had never seen us and therefore they wanted us to present this whole thing again to them. Whereas we had spent like so many months in negotiation, but then when it comes now to the government representation in the meeting, then they take a posture that we've never met before. So, so then you, you, you begin again to understand these dynamics, is that they don't want to also look like they gave in to this thing or this project without consulting with government. So even then they have to play, they have sort of have to balance this. So they weigh and if they see that the chief is agreeable, then they, they now swing your side. If they see the chief is not agreeable, then they'll, they will stick with the chief. But for me, every day was always an, an appreciation that the, the struggle was real and the struggle was based on being able to transcend all these kinds of realities. Negotiation was not about winning somebody to come to your side and understand you, but you also needed to protect them, to protect the fact that they have bought what you have, you have brought on the table. You've negotiated with, by that time. At this level, you've already negotiated and had conversations with tenants, because then the tenants are the ones who struggle and suffer when there's lack of sanitation or there's lack of water or there's lack of all other things. But for you to deliver to the wider community, there's this few or this very, um, what do I call it? Um, critical level that you have to go to. And you carry the voice of the people that you've been working on for the last two years. You almost can't give up. You have to keep going regardless of how. Because then the other thing we began understanding at that time is it's so hard for tenants to go and tell the landlords this is what we want. Because what the landlord will see is that they'll see this is, a, this is an opportunity to increase rent. Oh, this is what you want. Okay, I'll give you, I'll increase rent. So the, the idea was then how do you bring in infrastructure without necessarily uh, being make, um, making it too expensive for communities? Because that's the other challenge. Which again goes back to the point that sometimes, and when I look at some of the settlements that government worked in and provided infrastructure, it was always the settlements that were very easy to, to work in in terms of they were semi-planned. So if you look at um, Mombasa, Ziwalangombe settlement, government provided infrastructure. But it was because Ziwalangombe is also really planned. I mean, you, you, have, you have streets that are, that are all, the subdivision happened, so it was easy for infrastructure to be laid. But then when you come to settlements that, have, that came and organized themselves, government will not select those ones. And I think we tried that. I remember a time when we, um, we had this negotiation with the World Bank and, and we were saying, look, communities have already collected their own data. The only th it's, ripe for, it's ripe for upgrading. We don't need to collect more data. This is data collected by communities. So pick these settlements, let's put infrastructure. But World Bank didn't pick these settlements. They probably wanted more settlements that were easier to work on. There's, I guess, a transition that has happened over time um, with how communities wanting to access land have had to encounter. But then also, there's also development partners that come, organizations that come in and are supporting communities also must enter that similar complex reality. I remember when we did the, the railway, it was also just that demonstration of um, even when the land is public land, it's real government land, you probably never will escape the fact that there's communities 
over time have realized that um, they're not going to be evicted. So there's a way that um, we can also be part of helping government manage this housing stock situation. So when that comes with the challenges of then being able to, to work out how do you look at the interest of the greater good versus then the people that want to profit from the situation as it is.